Hello everyone, this is Samir from Audio Science Review. I've gotten a number of requests to do more tutorials on how to read the measurements uh, when I post a review on Audio Science Review. So I thought I'd uh, create a new series, not only explaining the, the uh, measurements, but also to teach you to be able to assess them very, very quickly. Um, when I post a review, uh, usually you see in about two or three minutes somebody commenting on how some device good or bad. And it might come as a shock to some of you who have never seen measurements or how somebody could, you know, read the review that fast. But if you stick around, actually read the reviews for a few months on, on ASR, you'll also gain the same knowledge. Um, my goal in this video is to teach you that so that you could just scan the, the measurements and, and, uh, and what's stated in the review and, and arrive at a conclusion quickly. The uh, reason for that is that I do a review almost every day, and uh, if you want to keep up, you better be quick at, at assessing things, and, and uh, that's what this is about. Um, you're going to notice that I'm going to speak a lot faster to the tune of the, uh, uh, to the theme of these videos, and uh, to keep them shorter. So if you want to slow it down, use the YouTube controls to slow down my voice. Okay, I thought I'd start with a review of a DAC that I did uh, a few weeks ago from a new company called uh, uh, Zidu. Um, they have a, a sub-brand name called Eversolo, and they sent me this uh, Z8 DAC. And uh, it's a very attractive, lovely looking DAC. It has a graphical user interface and you can actually select view meters and such, and uh, I really enjoyed playing with it. And um, uh, the reason I show you this is because it, it has, as you'll see, state-of-the-art performance and, uh, and should calibrate you on what a great performing DAC looks like. And then, uh, you know, I'll show you an example of, of not so great DAC. Um, uh, devices like this, uh, you know, have different outputs on them um, or inputs uh, for that matter, depending on what I'm testing. In case of DACs, you either have RCA, which we call unbalanced, or we have XLR, which are balanced. Uh, that will become important in a second when I talk about the output voltages uh, on this thing. Whenever you buy a high-end DAC, make sure it at least has uh, XLR outputs. The inputs are the usual inputs of USB, USB, in this case it has USB-C, which is unusual, and optical and, and coax input and Bluetooth and what have you. But anyway, uh, my measurements always start with uh, what's called a dashboard. I use an audio precision analyzer that's hiding down there. And when you first run this app um, that controls the analyzer, it pops up with a dashboard which you can configure. Down here are what are called meters. You can tell it to show you different me uh, measurements in the form of both bar, bar graphs in the middle over here. Oh, sorry, you weren't seeing my cursor. And... Um, and, and some values in here. And above here are two graphics. Uh, when I first got this analyzer, I really thought that this was a good snapshot of a performance of a device where at a glance, instantly and in real time, if you're sitting here, can see the performance of the, of the device. In case of this DAC, um, I feed it a one kilohertz tone, and that's what this tone is over here, and that's what it looks like. It's a sine wave, and that's what a sine wave looks like. And in an ideal DAC, we would just see this spike in here and nothing else. We wouldn't see any noise to the left or right of it, and we wouldn't see these spikes, which are harmonic distortions or otherwise. They're just These are all extra junk that an ideal DAC wouldn't have. Uh, nothing's ideal in our world, so um, we're going to see some distortion no matter how good the device is. And in this case, uh, we see that this device does have uh, some distortion. Uh, but if we look at the spikes in here, this tallest spike, or the worst spike is the second harmonic is at two kilohertz so double the one kilohertz and we see that it's below one minus 130 that means 130 decibels lower than the signal itself to give you a perspective one is 115 is threshold of hearing so this is the if this is the loudest signal that you're playing um, if minus 115 is where the distortion lands, it's inaudible in all conditions for all content and for all people. So provides a level of transparency threshold. So this device is 15 dB better than that, so it's way into transparency. So we're not bothered by these, although when it comes to ranking the best of the best, we do look at them. But anyway, that's where my eye first goes to, and uh, I look at the spray in here. And then this noise floor is down here that is showing. This, this noise floor is not the actual noise floor. I won't get into what it is, but for now you want it to be somewhere down here, as you can see, just hugging the bottom of the of, of the graph. 
Then uh, I usually glance at this uh, number on the left over here. This is the voltage that's coming out. So if we look at the uh, uh, what's called the RMS value of this sine wave, uh, it uh, coming. It's, if you measure with a simple voltmeter, it's about 4.1 volts is what's coming out of that XLR output. Uh, the nominal and I'm proper in my view, uh, output voltage for uh, uh, any source device is about four volts. Uh, it can go higher, but I don't, excuse me, I don't want it to be lower than this. And uh, this device gets there and just got a hair more than that. Uh, it's got, a, I believe has a volume control, I don't remember, uh, to bring it down. But anyway, it has four volts in there and that's what I like to see. So if the XLR output all of a sudden is three volts, 2.2 volts or some other number, I'll note that it's not good. Uh, I've tested hundreds of DACs that have XLR output and, and they'll properly put out four volts. Uh, some parts of the industry haven't gotten the news and, and they will output different levels and, and I'll talk about that. This uh, value here is of no importance. It's just telling me the frequency, which I said is one kilohertz and you already see it. This is an actual measurement. So sometimes it'll say, you know, uh, 1.000 and you may have a five at the end or 0 .0, 9999 or something. It's not material. Uh, sometimes I find issues where these numbers jumping up and down. You won't see it in this snapshot, but I'll note it. But in general, this one is not very useful. What is useful as far as what summarizes all this stuff is on the right. And these two displays are actually the two of the, the same uh, measurement, but expressed two different ways. First one is THD plus N ratio. And that says, look, if we take the, uh, this signal that's coming out with that, and we subtract the, our original wanted signal, one kilohertz, whatever remains has a certain energy, it has a voltage. And we take a ratio of that voltage, the sum of these distortion spikes and the noise, and we take a ratio of it to this one kilohertz, what is that percentage? In this case, you know, the percentage is extremely small. So you got 0 0.000070, and then that's a percentage. So you got two more zeros in there as far as ratio. These numbers are kind of hard to remember, even though this is an industry standard measurement, THT plus N, that's total harmonic distortion plus noise. And uh, a way to make this more understandable is to take a log of that and express it as a positive number. And that, that is sine at in this context. And so this, these two numbers are the same. You could say this device has a, this small number, THT plus N, or you can say it's got 123 dB sine at. So this, you know, it's a much easier number to play with, and that's what I and everybody else that reads the forum and goes by rather than try to memorize what these numbers look like. So, but what does 123 mean? Uh, is it, was it highest number 200 or is the highest number 125? We don't know, right? So what I do is that, and what I started doing a long, long time ago, I just created a running table of, of all the sign ad values that I was getting, and uh, uh, pretty soon that graph became quite long, and whenever a device actually lands on the top, what I call top 20, I just show that top 20 in here, and that's what I've done. So um, this is out of 400 some DACs that I've tested, this device landed in number six position. Now it's a bit of silliness in here where I've got a fraction of uh, dB in here. The sign at value actually varies, and that accuracy is just for fun. Uh, the main message in here is that this DAC landed in top 20. That's what you want to walk away from, uh, walk away with rather than it's you know, number one or number five. It really doesn't matter. It just, what matters is that it's state of the art. So here's an unknown company. You may have looked at their devices. And I would have looked at their devices and said, hey, what do they know about producing good DACs? You know, I've never heard of Ever Solo or Zedu. And who are these guys? Uh, and here you go, measure this and an instant snapshot says, hey, Look, I'm um, state of the art. You know, the proper engineers out there designed this thing and squashed all sorts of noise and distortion that they could and landed it in this spot. So almost always you could actually stop here and predict what the rest of the measurement is going to do. Um, why? Because an engineer that sat there and, and minimized noise and distortion likely paid attention to everything the stack was doing. And a lot of the other measurements are actually uh, 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 if this, these numbers aren't good, it pollutes the other ones too. So a sign ad isn't uh, be all end all of, of the measurements, but it's a very powerful uh, predictor of the rest of the performance of, 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 uh, um, of the DAC or amplifier, what have you. It's a little bit like a car performance. If 060 is three seconds, chances are it doesn't, you know, uh, have sloppy handling or, you know, lousy brakes. So, 
is a good indication that something is is well engineered and and this device is. But we don't stop there. I, I keep going just in case we find issues elsewhere. You know, we've developed the rest of the test for a reason. But as far as speed reading in here, is the voltage correct? Yep, four volts. What's the sign at? Where does it land in a table? Boom. Wow, this is already good. So you could stop here again and have a great in impression of, you know, how well engineered the device is. Now, some of you don't have balanced outputs and you want to know how well it performs out of RCA output. Typically, RCA output is a little bit worse. It can pick up noise and it has lower output. Uh, what's the output that it should have? Two volts so, or half of the four volts that XLR outputs. So we're looking over here for two. And here, we again, we want to look for something that's at least 115 dB. And, and this device it lands around 170. It actually has a more of a penalty for using RCA than many other devices that I measure. But uh, actually, does it 6 dB? No, actually, it's all right. It's all right. So usually there's a 6 dB difference in, in here between these two. So whether you use RCA output or XLR output, this is a state of the art, basically, performance. Now, some people say, well, look, uh, this is at maximum volume. I don't listen to maximum volume. What's the performance at less than maximum volume? So I run this test, and there's a new version of this I won't talk about that's actually better than this. But uh, I change the input digital values and measure the output uh, relative to the sign out. So the same sign out we've been talking about. And we see that if, even if you drop the output to just 0.1 volt, this uh, DAC actually has 100 dB sign out. So, uh, and it achieves transparency at like half a volt. So performance is, is superb anyway. Um, I haven't found this to be very revealing um, other than people use them for comparison when you have other designs like AVR, sometimes have analog volume controls that can make this thing say something useful, but this is more informative for membership that, that's interested. What is not informative is this next number. Uh, people could argue, you know, how well can people hear distortion? Maybe they can't even hear 0.1%, let alone 0.0001%. But one thing you can hear is noise and hiss coming out of your uh, speaker, especially the Twitter. And the more sensitive your speaker is, the more you can hear it, and the louder you play, the, the more you could hear. And so I measure the dynamic range uh, of, of the DAC, and there's a special technique in this measurement to make sure the DAC doesn't mute and fool this measurement. But basically, we measure the, what is the loudest and uh, that the DAC can produce versus what's the lowest signal that it can produce. And I measure both out of XLR and RCA because, uh, again, the output voltages are different, so the dynamic range will be different. So the left-hand side is XLR output, uh, balanced output, and the right-hand side is RCA unbalanced. And we see that it produces 129 dB of, of uh, signal noise ratio or dynamic range in this case. There's this, they are the same. There's a slight distinction I won't get into, but for now, just assume they're the same. And so what this says is that if your playback level is at 129 dB, your noise level would be at 0 dB. Okay. Uh, our hearing threshold is about minus 5 dB, around 3 to 4 kilohertz. Um, so, and you know, 129 dB would be exceedingly loud, but there are concerts, you know, people have measured, you know, live unamplified uh, concerts have measured, and it can be 122, 125. So if you're building reference quality, state-of-the-art, reproducing, you know, live music, you want to get about, you know, 120, 125 in here. Um, I help a little bit in interpreting this number by dividing this by six. If you take any decimal number divided by six, it gives you what is called equivalent number of bits or E knob, E N O B. And I do that for you, just do a sip, divide by six and you get 21.5 in here. My target in here is 20. 20 gives you 120 dBs of dynamic range with a noise flow that essentially is inaudible. So anything above 20 is gravy, and we have 21.5. By the way, if you apply equalization, a digital equalization, you eat into this headroom. So that's another reason you want to have you know better number than you think you're going to have. Uh, you're going to need in here. Uh, RCA is a little bit worse, as I mentioned, and uh, we lose one and a half bits of dynamic range in here, but still excellence 20 bits. So uh, this gives you noiseless system and if you haven't heard this it's just a joy if you got a system right now where you stick your ear next to the Twitter and you hear or buzz and then you switch it to one of these devices it's such a relief to just hear nothing absolutely nothing okay so so far we've covered two types of noise and distortion 
People come back and often criticize these tests and say, well, all of these are one kilohertz so far, the signal that we test. And what if I have more signals than, than one music is in one? So we say, fine, we'll go ahead and, and use a synthetic test uh, that has 32 tones in it. And uh, this tone also runs at 192 kilohertz. It could be at lower frequencies, but I like the fact that it runs at a higher sample rate. So we measure wide bandwidth performance of, of the DAC anyway, not everything at 44.1 kilohertz. And so we've got 32 tones going in. And when we look at the spectrum, you indeed see that 32 spikes. An ideal uh, DAC would have 32 of these spikes. And then the f bottom in here would fall off the chart. It would be nothing. Again, we don't have ideal devices, so the bottom in here falls down here. It shows basically either noise, if it's random, or it shows intermodulation distortion, which is distortion that happens when you have multiple tones. In this case, I eyeball this thing and I look at it and I say, yeah, it's about, it looks like it's reaching about 130 dB going down here. What does 130 mean? Again, it's a kind of a hard number to digest, so I divide it by six, and it gives us equivalent number of bits of 22.5. Remember, my target is 20 bits of, of, of uh, you know, basically range of clean to top of the signal, and we have 22.5 bits, so that's exceptional performance, you just more than you need. Extremely low noise, and, you know, not every device is this good. Um, so, Looking at this thing, you just want to see noise floor down here. You don't, if you know, a lot of times you actually see the noise floor climbing up, it means the higher the frequency, the more noisy the device gets. Amplifiers tend to do that and some DAX do it. So you want to see a flat response and very low number and something above 20 over here. Uh, this test um, is a little bit harder to explain, but I'll, I'll try. Um, a DAC, if you think about it, it's the simplest uh, uh, device is that we give it a digital value and we say produce this voltage. So if I said digital 1, I wanted to get 0.1 volt. If I said digital 2, it should give me 0.2 volts. If I said digital 3, it should give me 0.3 volts. I'm making up these numbers. The actual numbers are hard to understand because uh, they're binary coded. But uh, for the purpose of this discussion, you know, that what I just described is a perfect DAC. If I double the input value, digital value, that I tell to produce, the output should double. If I triple it, quadruple it, and so forth. And that's what this measurement does. It says, let's start at minus 120 dB. So we take our maximum four volts that I showed you, and we go 120 dB down, and we give that digital sample to the DAC and say, produce that. That number better be minus 120 dB as a measured voltage coming out of the DAC. So the two need to match one to one. And then if we show that as a deviation, we get this line. As it says, this, this is called a linearity test, and he says the ideal is zero dB, which means no variation. This DAC nails it, as do everything else in that top 20 graph, and even cheaper devices. Their DACs are $100 and still do this. So this is a requirement uh, to happen. Uh, again, there's special techniques behind this DAC, this measurement, which I won't go into. If you do it incorrectly, you measure the wrong thing. But you want to see a flat line in here. It's not the end of the world. We get little variations in here, but you know, in anything more than a couple hundred dollar DAC, I expect it to be you know ruler flat in here, meaning that forgetting about noise and distortion, we get the proper output voltage whenever we tell it this is the, in the right input. Okay. Um, jitter is a fancy buzzword. We have a special signal we use to detect uh, jitter. And that special signal is called a J-test signal. It has a 12 kilohertz tone. Uh, it's actually not a tone, but I won't go into details of it. But essentially what you should see in this display is a 12 kilohertz spike in here because that 12 kilohertz exists in there. This test is run at 48 kilohertz sampling, by the way. And embedded in there are, uh, is a little square wave that generates these spikes. So it's a 24-bit level. So, you know, these bits in here, an ideal DAC would have low enough noise floor in here where you see the sequence of uh, little spikes showing up. So these are not bad things. This actually desired these little spikes over here that start at minus 140 and go down. So we want to see a noise floor that this clean and in here. We don't want to see any other spikes in here. If you squint, you see some tiny things in here, but they're just incredibly low level, low level at minus 150. Um, we just absolutely don't care. So this I call perfect. 
and uh, I'll test this thing with different inputs. Um, sometimes some inputs aren't as good as others. Sometimes Toslink may have more jitter, sometimes USB, although that's less uh, frequent. Uh, it's sometimes better coax also and uh, show all three inputs uh, as far as distortion, as far as uh, jitter. Know that uh, many times jitter is actually created internally to the device. We usually think of jitter as a transmission line deficiency, but uh, many times the device itself, the DAC itself, generates enough internal noise that messes with its clock and manifests itself as jitter. And we also see other spikes that are not jitter, but again, unwanted in here. So. Uh, again, that's what this is why ideal one looks like. I'll show you less ideal, ideal one in another uh, DAC measure. Um, another example of a test we run, which is more than one tone, is, is this intermodulation distortion. And the idea here is that instead of using one kilohertz tone, we use two tones and then see what happens when we have both of them. There are different versions of this where different frequencies, different amplitude. I like this version from an uh, organization called SIMPTI and that came up with this idea of using a 60 hertz and a seven kilohertz at a four to one amplitude. And the nice thing about it is that it's basically measuring distortion at low frequency, 60 hertz, and high frequency, seven kilohertz, at the same time. So we take the distortion generated by both tones, combine them together, and express it as just one value. And uh, we plot that. Um, an ideal device, again, would have no intermodulation distortion and there'll be nothing on this graph, and we don't get that. Now, typical of some of my measurements, I show an upper and lower bound. These I've picked for convenience, but they have worked out well. Um, this top line is a Razer uh, phone adapter that uh, I think is $9 or $15 little thing you hook up to your USB-C on your phone and listen to music with it on phones that don't have analog output, which is unfortunately most of them. And so that's a $9 and $10. It should be embarrassing for any, any product that costs more than $10 or $15 to be up here where the yellow line is. And the blue line is this Topping DX3 Pro, which is a $250 DAC that came out maybe three, four years ago. I just left it in there as a reference. For the longest time, many DACs, regardless of price, couldn't beat it. And But certainly this device, which is $700, better beat it. And indeed it does. So if we look at the this red and pink is the performance of this uh, uh, Ever Solo DAC, and we can see that it beats the uh, Topping DX3 Pro. Uh, with a very good margin, as I expect state-of-the-art DAX to do. And we see a declining line, which is what we want to see. We don't want it to start to tip up like the, this uh, dongle does, which means distortion has taken over the noise and, and it's going up. So we want to have a line that just goes down, meaning that there's noise and, and we're just overcoming noise in here. And that's what we have in here. Uh, if you look a squint in here, you'll see there's a little bit of a rise in distortion in here. Uh, ESS DAX, company ESS that build the DAX silicon that's inside these larger boxes, very, very common high performance DAC, um, has an issue that if you don't know how to deal with it, it'll actually uh, balloon up the distortion up here. I coined that the ES, ESS DAC IMD hump because it would generate a hump. And for the longest time, this was unknown and products were coming out with this uh, problem. Uh, until I pointed out in review after reviews and good companies went back and, and had to find their own solution. ESS was of no help to them. And, uh, and so today you can get brand new DAX with this chip in it and we'll have a giant hump in them because you know, they didn't know and they didn't measure, they didn't pay attention to this test. So bottom line, as far as speed reading, you, you know, depending on the price of the product, you want it to beat this uh, blue line and be down here. Uh, you don't want to be in, in this region this day and age. Okay. Um, these other tests are a little perfunctory, but people are curious. Um, the, these DACs are what is called oversampling DACs and they have a digital filter in there. And that digital filter can be programmed to either have a very sharp response or have a slow response. The reason you need to have a filter at all is because the whole process generates spurious ultrasonic uh, information, which you, you're supposed to chop off. And uh, instead of having one algorithm in there and having people argue whether that's the best one or not, most chip companies actually give you a choice of many. In this case, there's seven of them in here. And I plot the frequency response of, of these uh, 
um, different filters. So I change the filter, run the test, change the filter, run the test. Here you want to see something that clears this 22 kilohertz uh, bandwidth because the sampling rate is 44.1 kilohertz. We want to see half of that. And not only does it clear that bandwidth, but it, it lands at the lowest point possible over here. Uh, some of these, like you can see this blue one in here, it actually doesn't go very low. And that means it's not truncating all the uh, ultrasonic information. Some of them are very slow. As you can see, these two over here, where they will allow then a lot more of that distortion to exist. And that will actually screw up the performance elsewhere. There's this fallacy where people think this slow uh, filters are better. No, they're not better. So uh, I'll show you over here what happens with some of these slow filters. You'll see that with some of the slow filters, the response can actually be compromised below 20 kilohertz. And, you know, why, you know, have a DAC that can't even produce 20 kilohertz properly. So you want to have the sharpest, nicest filter. And in this case, the default filter, which is this red one, was the best one. And you can see that it goes out here. And that's the recommendation I've made. You know, for, you know, welcome to go muck with these filters. They're not part of the pure performance of the device. It's just a functionality, and I'll show you what happens in here. Okay, this one is not perfunctory. So uh, a lot of the measurements that I've, me that I've mentioned, there are one or two or 32 frequencies, but what happens at every frequency, and that's what this graph is. And so what we do is that we measure the distortion from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz and see what we get. Uh, this test is limited to 90 kilohertz bandwidth for reasons I won't go into, but it includes harmonics that happen all the way up in ultrasonic range. And this stack having a great filter will produce a very nice linear response. And this dash line is, is an older but good $99 DAC, which broke the price, price barrier at the time, uh, called the Hadas Tone Board. And at $99 had this performance, so you better be below this, whatever you do. And this DAC is certainly below that. So we want to see a flat line if we can get it, which means it's frequency independent. And we want to see it below this dash blue line, okay? Uh, this one's a headphone amplifier, so I won't go into that. So that's an assessment of all the measurements, but with uh, for state of the art. I recently tested this uh, Emotiva ERC4 CD player, and the owner wanted me to test the uh, DAC portion of it, and so that's what this this is uh, this test is about. So please don't complain that <laughs> why I didn't measure the CD portion. All the test signals that I mentioned are 24 bit in the other in the other uh, overview, and if the CD can't place uh, 24 bit, so everything degrades if I measured from CD anyway. A uh, little bit of preface in my reviews. If I find issues, I report them. In this case, I couldn't. I could turn on the, the CD player, but it would do nothing else. It wouldn't open this drawer. None of the controls worked on a remote control or the front panel. So I had to take the top off and looked in there, and I found this uh, ribbon cable had come halfway loose. It looked like it was fully connected, but it had slid loose, so it was not snapped all the way in, didn't have a locking connector, didn't have some glue to keep it down, and in shipping or otherwise, or maybe they didn't push it all the way in, it had come gradually loose. So I had to fix this. I'd say about 5% of the time I have to go fix something before I can measure it uh, uh, on this thing. So it's not a fun part of the job where you put this thing in there and turn it on, pull your hair out for, you know, for 20 minutes trying to figure out why you can't get the device to work. Anyway, um, let's look at the dashboard now. Same dashboard that we looked at, um, balanced output, XLR output. Look over here, instead of four volts, we're getting 2.1 volt. Why? It's like there's no rhyme or reason for this thing to output 2.1 volt out of the blue. Uh, four volts, what it should pronounce. So you see me uh, noting that, that it outputs too low. Then I look on the right side and look at how dirty this spectrum is versus what we had just looked at. If I go up here and I'll scroll all the, all the, all the way up, look at the uh, clean, this spectrum is over here. And now look at the spectrum over here. Um, now, I expect to see stuff on the right side because they're harmonic distortions, multiples of, of this. But then stuff on the left is always puzzling because that's not harmonic energy, it's lower frequency. So that doesn't make sense. I can't figure out why this is there. It's like 600 hertz. What's 600 hertz doing over here? It's probably some kind of interference. 
inside the unit, some microprocessor running at that frequency, doing something, causing a spike. And then as I was watching it, this red channel would dance up and down, come down, go up, then come down. Um, very puzzling. A lot of times this comes from uh, noise bleeding over USB from a computer. The USB interface is not clean, and it's the job of the DAC to filter all that. And somehow it does it for one channel, but not the other one. So some kind of grounding issue internally uh, to the DAC. So not good. And what's the penalty in all that? Over here in the Synod. See, the Synod, it's not 120 dB anymore. It's down to 94. And then uh, I plot this thing in here and this thing, this uh, eye chart. You can't see it because it's got 400 DACs in here. Uh, but I put a little tick mark in where it landed. So it landed in this orange area. So I have red, orange green and blue and those the top 20 are you know way out here on the left so we clearly see that this lands in a fair category meaning that it's not completely broken but uh you know, surely in this day and age where I think it's a six seven hundred dollar uh CD player and DAC, it better at least land in good very good, if not, you know, excellent. Uh to land in this fair and certainly in poor area is just bad. So it's not that we put a lot of value on sign up per se, but you know, when the number just lands in a table and you know, it self incriminates itself by saying, look, this is all the effort I did. Uh, you know, why wasn't the designer measuring and saying, hey, why in the heck do I have all this garbage coming out of that? There's nothing musical about this garbage, by the way. Don't fall for this thing about, you know, distortion can be euphonic. No, 99.9% .9 of the time distortion is not euphonic. Certainly, this is not euphonic, this is not euphonic, and noise that goes up and down is not euphonic. Okay, as before, I measured the RCA output also, you know, it's got the same problem, so uh, nothing new in here. I measured the dynamic range, and uh, instead of 20 bits, that's my threshold. I uh, like to see 20, uh, 120 dB over here and 20 over here. Uh, we're getting only 99. Now, 99 is better than a CD. CD is 96. In reality, it's about 93. So this is almost good enough for a CD player function. Um, but it's not good enough for uh, as a DAC. You can get, again, very cheap DACs that run circles around this. Um, XLR has just a tiny bit of improvement, lands at 17 bits. So for 16 bit content, you know, not enough margin there, but okay. Uh, so if you have very low standards and maybe you bought this thing used for hundred dollars, you'll be okay. Uh, but if you paid full price for it, I would feel bad. Now look at this linearity. Remember, I said this has to be a you know flat line, and it kind of is a flat line when its, it's job is easy. But as the signals get smaller and smaller, they get subjected to error and noise. And look at how messy it is. So. You know, if, if I look at it and I measure it when it's lost half a dB, and that's when I complain. So this thing is around minus 110. So as a practical matter, it's not an issue. As an engineering matter, yeah, it should be better. But anyway, wherever it starts to be bad enough, I measure that and explain that it, this thing is good to 18 bits. 18 bits is better than 16 bits. So for CD playbacks, okay. But as a, you know, comparing to all those competitors, it's pretty poor. Um, now look at where our intermodulation noise land. Remember I said this is the $10-$15 dongle, this is a you know, four-year-old $250 device, and we want to beat the blue line, and look at this, this is landing in the middle of these two, which is not good. And more than that, instead of keep getting better, it starts to tilt up and distortion takes over. So there's something in there that's causing distortion that lands at around minus 115 dB. That's not good. I expect this thing to, if it's gonna tip up, I want it to tip up just at the end, but not this early. So nothing to hang your hat on. Look at what happened to our jitter. Look at the noise floor now, instead of being at the bottom in here, it has come way up here. And then it's got all these garbage spikes. Some of them are jitter whenever they're symmetrical from on both sides of the signal, they usually are jitter, but some of them are not. Like these two signals are not jitter. They're just spikes that just happen to be there. And, uh, it's just bad, and it's, it's uh, by the way, it didn't matter which input I use, so it's not a fault of the input, you know, uh, processing that's causing jitter, so you quickly see a problem. Uh, this DAC doesn't give you a choice of selecting different filters, even though the internal DAC chip probably has different filters, they've chosen not to expose it, and which is fine if you pick one of those good filters. And as far as the overall response is okay, as far as where it cuts off, but look at where it lands. Instead of going all the way down here, 
it stays way the heck up here. That means it's not able to attenuate the ultrasonic energy that shouldn't be there. And what does that mean? When we measure uh, the, the 20 to 20 kilohertz with a wide bandwidth of 90 kilohertz, meaning that we include uh, noise and junk that's all the way up to 90 kilohertz, this comes back to haunt you because that means that filter's not working well. And look at what happens as frequencies go up, we get more and more junk in the ultrasonic range. And look at the graph comparing to our cheapo uh, reference $99 DAC from four or five years ago. It loses to that and loses badly uh, on that. So a sign of poor engineering. Now note what I said early on in this, that I said whenever you get bad sign ad, is a great predictor or a good sign of the rest of the measurements and that you could have really just stopped in here. And you've seen proof of that in here so clearly. Uh, same with the other uh, review that I showed you. Uh, poor, poor DAC, instead of having 115, 120 dB, you only got 94. And every measurement from there was bad. Look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this. So that's how you can speed read uh, this stuff. And that's why sign out by itself may not be perceptually super important, but as a predictor of how well engineered the device was, uh, you know, it's, it's a good way to, to, uh, to judge something. So, and that's why membership keeps talking about what's a sign out of something, uh, because they know that means a device is well engineered, well measured or not. So, you know, you can see comments in here where I say a $99 DAC would run circles around this thing. Um, a um, little bit about my recommendations. This question comes up. I finish every review with a recommendation. When I did my first 10 reviews, I didn't. People kept asking me, so what do you think? So what do you think? So I provide a judgment. My judgment is all inclusive. Means I sit back and I you know, contemplate what, uh, what did I just see in here. Uh, usually I ignore price, but not always. Uh, for example, if you show me state-of-the-art performance, and the device is $20,000, that's great, I still recommend it. But if you charge $5,000 and produce crap results, I will take that into account that you charge me so much money on top of giving me bad results. But in general, I look at this as if you, I was a mechanic, you took me to shop for a used car with you, I look at it, look at all the problems, I explain it all to you, but at the end you turn to me and say, would you buy this for yourself? That's what this is. I tell you, if I would buy this for myself, if I had a need for such a device, I certainly would not buy this, this DA, uh, the DAC in this CD player uh, for five, four, six hundred forty dollars or whatever it is, or for any money really. I would do without if this was the only one out there. Uh, fortunately, it's not. And uh, so that's what this is. Now, membership often complains about this, says, hey, you were too harsh or you were too easy. I said, fine. So I started a new mechanism, which is on top, which is you all get to vote if you're a member. And you can see 118 people or 85% voted as, as this being very poor. And the next one's less poor. And then, you know, fine. Two people thought it was okay. And nobody thought it was, it was great. Uh, people complain about this, saying, how dare you judge something without uh, having owned it and played with it? And the answer is simple. You're looking at the same data, more or less, that I'm looking at to make my judgment, which is, you know, you have objective measurements. This is real data, tells you if this thing is performant or not, if it's well engineered or not, what the price is. I talk about issues like reliability and features. and you know, you all get to judge. If you think you should judge it some other way, you can. Or if you don't want to vote, you don't have to vote. If you want to ignore this, ignore it. But oftentimes this tracks more or less what I think, but sometimes people disagree and it's interesting to look at the ratios in here, what the consensus of the, of the community is. Okay, so let's see, uh, this took 38 minutes but uh, you should be able to <laughs> do this work in three minutes now. Just look at the DAC, go on audioscienceReview.com and click on this reviews tab on top over here. And you'll see all my recent reviews and then just, you know, well, some of the speakers and stuff you, uh, you can't uh, look at. But the way, there's a lot of commonalities, you know, I'll cover amplifiers and things, but you can see the same sign ad, you see the same graph. So a lot of commonalities. So if you learn this one about DAX, you'll also learn those. But I'll do a speed reading on those and hopefully those will go faster on this one. Okay, see you in a future video. Bye-bye.